Hey guys, Tate and Gus with Yukon Gear and Axle again, and today we are going through some of the more uh, frustrating parts of setting up differentials and some of the phone calls that we take over the past, you know, decade plus uh, that we've been here. And it's just tech setup stuff and, and the questions that some of you guys have and that we hear more often than not. So as far as, as what we're looking at, I've got a list here um, of, of the ones that I get the most of really. Mm -hmm. Um, but so one of the first ones that I would bring up is, is pinion bearing preload and how do you set bearing preload in general? So what would you say to somebody? Cause I know I've got my go-to can response, but somebody that's setting up, uh, carrier bearings and pinion bearings and what is like some helpful tips on that? Well, most common question we get is, or at least that I get, what's the torque spec? And on most modern differentials, there is no torque spec. Uh, you've got a crush sleeve in there that sets your bearing preload, which is a chunk of spring steel, and you're not really torquing it down uh, per se with a, a torque wrench. You're tightening it until you achieve a proper bearing preload and rotating drag. That so, rotating drag, I think, is what a lot of people have trouble with because I know my guys trying to explain that there's not a torque value for something like that is just like Greek. So to explain, I guess, a little more in depth, that drag is, it's, it's that rolling resistance, amount of force it takes to twist it, right? That's what you're looking exactly. for in the preload. Exactly. So it's it's yeah. the uh, rotational drag, not the brake wave torque, which some people are familiar so with. So it's not a stop and click, it's how much it takes to turn that and exactly. what that value is. Exactly, so you can't set that with a clicker style torque wrench, which a That's lot of people have. That's why you have to have. have the pendulum style or the dial indicator type. Exactly. That makes way more sense. So hopefully that cleared up that one for you guys. Um, it's definitely a little bit more complicated than as simple as we make it sound, but you definitely don't have a set value. So you're, you're tightening it down until you achieve a certain amount of drag. That's your pinion bearing preload. Now carrier bearing preload, a lot of guys don't even do it. I hear them talking about they just put it back in and it was super loose and they couldn't understand why. And it seems like that's just something that's misunderstood. I mean, can you over preload a carrier bearing? Not really. Uh, carrier bearing preload, I like to see it as high as you physically can get it. So if that means that you're using a housing spreader and beating the carrier back in with your dead blow mallet, that's, and that's perfect. Okay. Kind of, I talk, I, I share the story of we had this skinny tech in our shop and he had a, a breaker bar and a jack handle and he's hanging off the bench trying to tighten up the carrier bearings on this nine inch Ford. And he says, yeah, that's no, as tight as I can get it and never gonna hurt the bearing. Nope, nope. Uh, bearing preload equals heat, but carrier bearings, unlike pinion bearings, they're submerged in the gear oil. So they're constantly lubed, they're constantly getting the oil flowing over them and stuff. Uh, so you can have really, really high carrier bearing preload and not run into heat issues or wear issues or anything like that. The other thing that it does is it pre-stresses the housing. So it takes the deflection so out flexing. of the housing uh, so that when you're under load, when you're off-road and you're rock crawling and you're bouncing off of stuff, that housing doesn't flex as much. So it yeah. makes a much Flexion more- Flexion is bad, guys. That's not a good thing to have. Yes. Uh, makes what are some other stable. bad symptoms of lack of preload on a carrier, for example? Uh, lack of carrier bearing preload can cause spun bearings and races. Uh, if it's a bad case, uh, not only will it spin the bearings, it can actually cause the race to chew up the inside of the housing, which then requires no, machining the it housing. to mm. uh, restore it in the case of some applications. Other ones, it's just easier to just replace the whole housing assembly. No. And some of the symptoms that I run into with pinion bearing preload that I explain to my customers, if you've got noise on deceleration, no noise anywhere else, but when you're letting off the gas, that is almost always a pinion bearing preload issue, guys. So that's the first thing that I'd recommend people go check if you have that decel noise. So that's just another one of the tips that we've run into over the years. Yes. Um, another one that I get all the time is these bearings don't match my carrier or I've got an older vehicle and I bought a newer posi for it. What bearing should I be using on that? It's it's really that simple. There's just a different part number that fits it so that you can put the newer style posi into the older style housings. And it's just a conversion bearing. They call it the HD conversion kit. And we only really run into this on GM eight and a half uh, applications, some Model 35, some Dana 30 applications, but your sales rep will know which ones that you need and they should give you that information prior to you buying the parts so that you don't have to run into this. But should you buy it somewhere else, just give us a call. We've got all the parts in stock for that yep. as well. Um, when we're dealing with, with bearings and, and not necessarily preload, but just bearing setup, 
we run into situations where some aftermarket fitments are a little bit tighter than what they're used to dealing with. And that Definitely. can kind of freak some people out a bit, but there's a reason for it, right? Yeah. Most of our uh, pinion gears, the bearings fit much tighter on. Carriers are a bit tighter than uh, stock fitment. And it's for a reason. Uh, it helps to maintain bearing integrity. Uh, it helps to hold bearing preloads better. Uh, it Tight bearings and tight preloads are more structurally sound. So it's like when you're pre-stressing the housing on carrier preload. Exactly. Same thing on the pinion bearings or the carrier bearings. If it's a little bit of a tighter fit, take out some of that shock, that potential shock out of it and having that premature failure. Correct. On pinion bearings, I generally recommend uh, take it like a scotch bright pad, just quick scrub of the inside of the bearing, quick scrub of like the pinion shaft. You're not trying to remove phosphate coating or anything like that. And then make sure you lube them before trying to put them on. Yeah, dry fit's uh, not good. Dry fit is definitely not good. We've seen a lot of uh, bearings being galled when they go to put them on. And with as tight as the yokes fit, the tight as the pinion bearings fit and everything else, it really makes for a tough uh, time if you don't lube the bearings before installing them. In some cases, I've actually had to have my customers press them on, uh, just a general kind of get it on with the press and then pop it back off. And after that, it's a nice mated fit. Is it yes. kind of a, the marriage aspect of it? Yes. Same thing with the yokes. Mm -hmm. so, okay. So that, that if it's a little bit of a tighter fit, it's by design, guys. We're trying to make it so that these things last you a lot longer. They can take a lot more abuse. And we're really trying to make sure that it is the absolute tightest tolerance possible. So it's going to be a little extra effort, but it's worth it in the end, right? Correct. Okay. Another question that I get a lot, and it seems to be more prevalent with some of the newer vehicles, is why are these spider gears so hard to get installed? What's the, what's the point? Why can't I get it in? Is it wrong? I mean, what's going on, especially with Jeeps, like late model JK Wranglers? Perfect question. Uh, Jeep JKs, they change the spider gear design on them. It used to be everybody's used to the thrust washers where they're flat thrust washers. Uh, Jeep to try and inc uh, get better noise vibration harshness uh, levels. They went and they created Belleville Springs to basically preload those. Uh, kind of like some of the posies use. Exactly. Uh, so it preloads all those gears together to help tighten everything up. Tighten and it up. makes it a really tough time to get it back together. Uh, the technique I usually use, I'll take a stub shaft, clamp it in a vise, uh, point it up, set the carrier over it, set your side gears into it, stick your cross pin into the uh, hole for it. Not all the way, you want it to just barely stick through. Like a lever. Exactly, and then you get your uh, spider gears up in there and you preload them and you use that cross pin as a handle to twist that into place. It walks those spider gears right in, compressing the Belleville Springs at the same time. So another part that we won't get into, but I'm sure we've had this conversation, is anybody that's ever worked on setting up a track lock or rebuilding one of those limited slips, it's the same concept. Correct. You gotta compress the one side or flatten it out one way or another to get those other small gears in. Exactly. Yeah, we run into that quite a bit. And while we're on the subject, some people are having trouble with carrier brakes still. It, it, it's, it's always been out there. Carrier brakes are, are consistent, but then there's some that never had them that suddenly do. Mm -hmm. uh, and the question is, I've got this gear set and now I can't get the backlash tight enough. I'm a mile away or I'm buried into it. I can't even back it off. Um, you know, what, what are you going through to try and to help figure that one out? So a lot of like typical Dana applications have carrier brakes. For example, Dana 44 is between 373 and 392 ratios. Traditionally, they go and they move the ring gear mounting surface closer to the pinion gear. When they came out with the Rubicons, what they did is they ran what they called a thick cut gear. Mm -hmm. That makes the carrier deck a little bit more rigid and everything else helps out with abuse. That kind of spawned a lot of aftermarket applications into making thick cut gears so you don't have to buy new carriers when changing gear ratios. So on Ford Super Duties, when you go and you want to uh, put a set of 456s in, but you had 373 stock, you run thick cut gear and it fits on the stock carrier. You don't have to buy a new carrier. Exactly. It, the gear is thicker uh, to make up the distance that the uh, ring gear mounting surface moved over. The problem that we run into now with that is that some people will buy their locker from one place, they'll buy their gear from another place, yep. and they'll follow the old school rules of 456 and up, 410 and down, and they'll buy the gear, and they'll get the locker, and then it's too close. That's where I get the too close conversation, because yes. I didn't realize it's coming in a thick cut. 
it's just one of those things that you got to pay attention to. If you're calling in and talking to your Yukon rep, we're going to have all the information for you. So we encourage you to call in all those tech questions. That's what we're here for. I mean, more questions, the better call into the tech line and subscribe to our YouTube channel and be sure to like us on social media. Thanks for joining us.